Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Mile Higher Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. Normally, my wife and co-host, Kendall, is here, but she is not back from maternity leave yet, so it'll be just me again, and obviously, Janelle, our producer, is here as well. Today, we're going to be diving into uh, a very brutal case, and it happens to be uh, an unsolved case of Paula Sladuski. We got a lot of requests for this one, and I thought it was important to dive into it because with a lot of these unsolved cases, it's obviously important to keep talking about it with the hopes that one day Paula's killer is found. And this one, unfortunately, just doesn't have a lot of information beyond sort of the, the main timeline of events. But just for a warning, the nature of her death is pretty brutal, but it's still very important that we cover this case because I do think there is a very big possibility that this case could be solved in the future, hopefully. So that's what we're going to get into today. But this episode of the Malhar podcast is brought to you by Case 5, Stitch Fix, Native, and Dipsy. Also, if you haven't checked out Malhar Merch in a while, we restocked a lot of our items and sizes. So check it out. It's MalharMerch.com. You can also get merch for the other shows at Malhar Media, including The Sesh and Lights Out, which is pretty cool. But with that out of the way, let's go ahead and just jump right into this case. We're going to begin by looking at Paula's life, because that's what's most important, is who she was as a person and, you know, what made Paula Paula. So Paula Sladuski was born on December 15th, 1983 in Garden City, Michigan, which is a suburb of Detroit. Her mother was Patricia Watkins and her father was Paul Sladuski. She also had a stepfather named Richard Watkins. Paula also had an older sister named Kelly Ferris and an older brother named Thomas Bustle. Kelly was 14 years older than Paula, so she wasn't just her big sister. She was almost a parental figure as well. Ever since she was little, Paula loved makeup and dressing up. She was always very drawn to the glitz and the glamour. She collected lots of Barbie dolls, and since she looked just like one, with long, shiny blonde hair and big blue eyes, Paula definitely wanted to live sort of that Barbie lifestyle. After all, it was the 2000s, so she definitely had that pink, girly, Y2K look going on. Paula had always been a gorgeous and free-spirited girl. Ever since she was little, she was the kind of girl who really lit up every room she walked into. She wasn't just a pretty face, though. She was a good student with grades to match. But Paula did have a rough childhood. Her dad wasn't really in the picture, and she sort of had a revolving door of stepdads. Paula was the kind of girl who loved everyone, but there was definitely a downside to her friendliness. Her brother said she was young, naive, and too trusting, and he would try to warn her that there was evil in the world that she needed to watch out for. And shockingly enough, when she was just 14, she was kind of dating a 29-year-old man. Her older sister Kelly was furious when she found out, but when she went to her mother about the issue, Kelly actually found out that her mother was allowing Paula to see this man twice her age. Kelly couldn't believe Patricia was letting this relationship continue, so Kelly was actually the one who had to call Child Protective Services and report the situation. The cops actually ended up getting involved and charged and arrested this 29-year-old man that Paula had been dating. Her mother said that growing up, Paula always knew that she was a stunning girl. And naturally, her good looks and love of glamour led her towards modeling. She wanted to be on the cover of magazines, and she started to try to break into the modeling world. At one point, she was apparently represented by a national agency. But her gigs were mostly things like commercials or Detroit car show modeling jobs, so Paula set her sights on what she hoped would be her ticket to fame. And that was through Playboy. In 2003, she was featured in the Playboy home video, Playboy The Ultimate Playboy Search. It was basically a video that showed scenes from a countrywide Playboy talent search. She didn't end up actually making the cut to become an official Playboy bunny, but she was really proud of her appearance on the video. Out of the hundreds of women who auditioned, she made the final edit of that special anniversary video. Paula loved her association with Playboy, and she collected little stuffed Playboy bunnies. She even painted her kitchen pink to match her Barbie lifestyle. Unfortunately, Paula never quite made it as a model, and she started to shift her career goals. She actually enrolled in nursing school out in California, and she and her boyfriend split their time between LA and Detroit. But she had to find other work to pay the bills since modeling wasn't working out. This included working as an exotic dancer. By the time 2009 rolled around, Paula was really looking to try and break into modeling again. But if that didn't work out, she was thinking of opening her own tanning salon or dog accessories boutique store. In the meantime, she was dancing at the Penthouse Club in Detroit and other strip clubs back in California. Her mom says she needed the money to keep up with her expensive lifestyle, but she was also saving money to pay for nursing school. That is until she dropped out. 
Patricia, Paula's mom, wasn't happy to hear that her daughter was working at strip clubs. Paula told her she was doing it because she made tons of cash, but unfortunately, that's when Paula's partying started to get out of control. Paula would party and drink until the sun came up, and once she woke up after a long night out and started to get the shakes, her mother warned her that she was showing signs of alcoholism. But that just made Paula really defensive, and the partying just continued. When she wasn't in Detroit, she lived near LA in Rancho Cucamonga, California, with her boyfriend, Kevin Klim. She was definitely an animal lover, and she had two pet Yorkie dogs named Taz and Bella that lived with the couple. Paula liked the fast life, VIP service, and celebrities, according to Kevin. And he gave her whatever baby wanted, but the relationship was far from perfect. So Paula and Kevin had been dating for two years by 2010. Paula was 26 and he was 34. According to Paula's stepdad and many other people, Paula and Kevin had a horrible relationship. At its best points, it was rocky, and there was never a honeymoon period. From the start, her family told her that they shouldn't be together because they constantly had knockout, drag down fights, and many of those fights got physical. They also told Paula to leave him multiple times during their relationship. They were both very volatile personalities, and they got into many fights, multiple of which involved the police getting called on them. The two of them both loved to party, and they partied hard. When they weren't drinking, things were great, but when they were bad, they were really bad. According to her family, Paula would go from a fun drunk to a mean drunk very quickly. And her sister said that Paula was also taking prescription diet pills at the time of these events. And those pills can really affect your behavior with their mood and weight loss effects, especially when you're drinking. So that definitely was affecting Paula's mental state. Kevin himself was no angel by any means. In 2008, he was busted in Michigan for possession of cocaine. During the summer of 2009, Paula was actually arrested for assault after the couple got into an argument and she allegedly smashed a bottle over Kevin's head. She was booked for assault with a deadly weapon, not a firearm though. The charges were reduced from a felony to a misdemeanor domestic battery, and then they were dismissed altogether in December of 2009 after Kevin declined to press charges. But that same month, Kevin was actually arrested again in Michigan. This time, he and Paula were visiting family and staying at a hotel when they got into a big fight. Kevin allegedly punched Paula in the face hard enough that it broke her nose. Kevin said that the broken nose was just an accident. Paula was possibly subpoenaed in the case and set to testify on January 4, 2010. But regardless if that was the case or not, Paula wouldn't be alive to make it to court. Things were already starting to really spiral for Paula, and things were only going to get much, much worse here in the near future. But we're going to get into more of Paula's story here after we take our first break, and we'll be right back. These days, everybody's got a phone, and everybody needs to protect their phones because Phones are very breakable. And if you're in the market for a new phone case, look no further than Casetify. They create phone cases that are not only sleek and stylish, but also protective. Their cases are engineered with EcoShock, which is their latest protection tech. Their newest iPhone 14 Impact Series is 20% more protective and just as slim. Their cases are optimized for protection up to 11 and a half feet, which is five times the military standard, withstanding drops up to 130 times. I've got a Casetify case on my phone right now. And you know what I'll do? I'll just throw it over my shoulder. You heard it smack on the ground. Let's see if it's okay. Look at that. <laughs> it is just fine. No cracks at all. That's how good their cases are. I drop my phone pretty much every time I get in and out of my truck. It slides out of my pocket, slams on the concrete below, and no cracks at all. It's super nice. What's cool is that they have a lot of really unique prints and you can customize your cases and add lettering, names, whatever you want to it, uh, which is pretty cool. They actually work with a diverse community of artists to come up with the prints for their phone cases, and there is some pretty truly unique stuff out there. With a strong built-in magnet, their cases are also MagSafe compatible and attached seamlessly to any MagSafe item, and they're sustainable as well. Their cases are developed from 65% recycled and plant-based material, as well as being partially made from upcycled phone cases through their Re-Casify program. So check out Casefy today and go to casefy.com and use our code 15 mile higher to get 15% off your order. That's code 15 mile higher to get 15% off your order or click the link in our description. Casefy has the most protective, cool looking and environmentally friendly phone cases the internet has to offer. Your shower routine, it's just that, a routine. You hop in, quickly lather up, rinse and then hurry on with your day. If your shower routine needs a little refresh, then you have to try Native. Native has your back with body washes that will make that time in the shower less routine 
and level up that shower game. Native's clean, effective body wash only uses simple ingredients that help cleanse your skin. All Native body wash is free of any sulfates, phthalates, and dyes. It's purified, plant-based, vegan, and cruelty-free and contains only gentle, cleansing ingredients. Unlike other body washes that use sulfates to create a rich lather, Native Body Wash offers that rich lather without the use of sulfates. Native Body Wash leaves your skin moisturized, feeling silky smooth and residue-free. When you shower with Native, you will smell amazing long after your shower thanks to their long-lasting scents. Want to smell spicy and woodsy or clean and fresh? Native has a scent option for everyone. Just recently, we went and got some of their new cabin collection, which are limited edition scents. My favorite is the warm cider and cinnamon. They also have cashmere rain, toasted marshmallow and vanilla, and wildwood and cardamom. Kendall and I have been using native products for years now, and it is our go-to for deodorant, body wash, and basically anything you need for your hygiene routine. They've got you covered. They even have toothpaste. Treat yourself to the ultimate self-care package and don't miss out on their new limited edition seasonal scents in their cabin collection. Upgrade your shower routine with Native Body Wash. Right now, go to nativedo.com slash milehire20 or use promo code milehire20 at checkout to get 40% off your first three-pack of Native Body Wash. That's nativedo.com slash milehire20 or use promo code milehire20 at checkout to get 40% off your first three-pack of Native Body Wash. Again, that's nativedeo.com slash milehire20 or use code milehire20. So during Christmas time in 2009, Kevin and Paula were staying in Michigan with family. It was a pretty cheerful holiday, but the couple wouldn't be sticking around for New Year's. Paula's sister Kelly had actually invited them to stay with her in South Carolina to ring in 2010, but their plans were already set. Her and Kevin had actually scored a deal on tickets to see Lady Gaga in Miami Beach. So Paula dropped off her Yorkies, Belle and Taz, with her mother, and she would pick the dogs up as soon as she got back from their trip. That was supposed to be that Monday, the 4th. Paula told her mom she had something special planned for her birthday once she got back from her trip. From there, she kissed her family goodbye and they set off on their trip on December 31st. According to Paula's brother, Paula was the one that paid for Kevin's plane ticket, all their food, and the hotel. And that day, the couple checked into La Flora, a hotel in South Beach's Art Deco district. From there, the party began. The couple spent New Year's Eve celebrating at the main event, a Lady Gaga concert at Fontainebleau in South Beach. But there was a man at the Lady Gaga concert standing behind them who was really weirded out by Kevin's behavior that night. He actually took a video of him in case he had to show it to police because Kevin was allegedly acting so aggressively. He was pushing through the crowd and just generally being obnoxious. But the couple spent the rest of the weekend partying at clubs and bars in Miami Beach. And by the time the night of the second rolled around, they were looking forward to another long night out. To start this night out, Paul and Kevin went out for a romantic, fancy dinner in South Beach, but they were still trying to keep the party going after that. The bartender recommended that they hit up Club Space, an after-hours techno club on the mainland, just across MacArthur Causeway. At the time, Club Space was open only on Saturdays from 11 p.m. to 11 a.m. Today, it's open from 11 p.m. to 11 a.m., Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so you can literally stay up all night drinking and partying as much as you want. It sounded like a lot of fun to them. So they decided to make that their plan. After all, it was just across the bridge from where they were staying in South Beach. On the way home from dinner, Paula stopped and bought a dress for the night. It was an eye-catching, skimpy, aqua blue dress that would be perfect for clubbing. Then they went back to their hotel in the Art Deco district and they slept for a little bit. Once they woke up again, it was time to get ready. And Paula liked to take her time. Her going out hair and makeup routine was super involved. And of course, Paula always liked to up the glamour. Once she was ready to go, they cabbed it to club space at 5.30 in the morning. By then, it was already the next day, Sunday, January 3rd, 2010. Paula and Kevin were definitely very intoxicated by the time they got to club space. And they kept drinking more and more once they got there. But that's when the trouble started. At one point, just before 7 a.m., Paula got into an argument with Kevin. Kevin said he tried convincing Paula to go home with him because she was too drunk. But she refused. Allegedly, Paula was pretty much just out of control. She had just gone completely wild. She was flirting with other guys and getting pretty raunchy on the dance floor too. Obviously, Paula's a very gorgeous girl, so there was tons of guys that were trying to dance up on her. And as you can imagine, being her boyfriend, Kevin got super irritated by this, and the two actually got into a fight. According to Kevin, though, it wasn't really a fight. Paula was just too drunk and dancing up on other guys, 
So he had grabbed her arm and told her that it was time to go. But Paula was having fun, didn't want to leave, and tried yanking her arm back as she wanted to stay at the club. The bouncers at the club saw what they described as a physical altercation between the two of them, so around 7 a.m. they actually kicked Kevin out. The bouncers at Club Space escorted him out of the club, and he wasn't allowed to get back in. According to Kevin, Paula asked for her credit card from him before he left. That apparently led him to believe she was coherent enough to stay alone. Still, Kevin said that after he got kicked out, he went to one of the bouncers and asked them to go tell Paula to come out and leave with him. He said the bouncer came back and told him that Paula wanted to stay and she wasn't ready to leave. Kevin leaving the club and talking to the bouncers was all caught on the club space's security cameras. After that, he took a cab back to their hotel and she stayed behind at club space. Kevin still had her phone in his pocket and the police were able to confirm the time Kevin got back to his hotel and the fact that he took a cab there. As for Paula, she was last seen on surveillance footage leaving the club at 7.21 a.m. And in the video, she was followed by a man and two more men turned to follow her as she walked out the door. Some reports say that Paula left only 20 minutes after her boyfriend was kicked out. According to Club Space's statement, they acted according to their policies and escorted Paula out right after they escorted Kevin out. Which this is kind of odd if you ask me, like if you know that they're a couple, why not just kick them out together? Because kicking her out by herself after you kick out her boyfriend doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But, I mean, maybe that's just exactly how it happened. And the two men in the surveillance footage, I believe, may have been the bouncers, but the surveillance footage is super bad quality, which is wild for a club to have such bad security footage so like i said before the surveillance footage shows paula leaving or being escorted out at 7 21 a.m and then five minutes earlier at 7 17 a.m kevin is escorted out of the club so it's only five minutes in between when each of them is escorted from the club which is just kind of weird i mean if you've ever been at a club normally both parties are kicked out at the same time so it's odd that she stayed for five minutes more and then was escorted out so there's just something weird about that. Some reports say that Paula left with a man or she was possibly approached or followed by a man as she was leaving, but other reports said that she left alone. Club Space said the men on the footage following Paula were employees escorting her out. One was the security manager and the other two employees that followed went outside to make sure that there wouldn't be some sort of scene caused outside of the club. Here's a little bit of the footage here. She walks out and this guy comes from this angle right after she walks out, meets up with this bouncer, they both walk out together. This is surveillance video from Club Space in downtown Miami around 7.20 a.m. Sunday morning. First of all, that surveillance footage is Trash. awful. Like, what is even the point of having surveillance footage if you can't even make out? You can't even tell if, like, that's a man or, or a woman no. in that at all. It just looks like black and white blobs walking around. Terrible. And this is, like, there. there's no excuse to not have better cameras. I mean, it's, like... Yeah, it's, it's almost 2010, like they, but still. Yeah, there's definitely better... There's HD cameras in yeah. 2010. Let's Let's be honest. I think it's probably because it's easy to be able to blame it on the security footage, right? If something does go down in your club and, exactly. you know, the club's held liable for something, then they're like, oh, well, you can't make out anything on the security cameras. It must not be working right or something and just blame the cameras. Right. Or they were just cheap and they didn't want to pay for good security cameras. But I think it's the, the latter probably. Mm -hmm. Club Space also said that each of the employees was accounted for on the video surveillance after they escorted her out of the club. And there was no way that they could have left with her. How are you going to tell that? The kid, like, Seems like a bunch you can't of, yeah. Tell who's on there. You can barely tell it's a person. <laughs> yeah, because they're wearing black maybe. And it okay. looks like they were wearing darker clothing. But from that footage, I don't think you could really definitively say who it was walking out the door. No. And apparently the staff had to clock in and out using their hands. Apparently there's trackable biometric data, which would apparently exonerate them from leaving with Paul. So exactly what happened to Paula once she left the club is completely unknown. But we do know one thing. After Paula left the club, she disappeared and she was never seen alive again. She was last seen wearing her short aqua dress and six inch black heels. And there are no other surveillance cameras at the club or in the area capturing any sort of next movements for her. Which is crazy to think yeah. that they didn't even have cameras outside. Well, that just blows my mind. You're in outside Miami. Outside cameras? Yeah, it's like... like and this was like, yeah, this was in the mainland, so it's off off sort of the, the main tourist area. So you would think, I mean, there's probably definitely more crime around in this area, North Miami. And so yeah. it's surprising that they didn't have any cameras on the outside, which to me, I'm starting to think this is a sketchy club. 
like there's just something weird about this club mm -hmm. um with its security you know it's almost like the they're trying to give all the right answers but there's not the evidence to sort of back that up at all so kevin apparently got back to the hotel and he said he went to sleep for a bit and then waited up for paula he said he figured that she was just playing games with him and that she'd be back soon they had had fights like this before and paula always came home the next day but as time went on and paula didn't show up Kevin started to get more and more anxious, and at one point he started walking around South Beach looking for Paula in case she was lost. Kevin apparently tried to report Paula missing 10 hours after he last saw her, but the police told him he needed to wait 24 hours before he could file a report, which is just wrong, honestly. Back at the hotel, Kevin explained his situation to the desk clerk, and she told him that he needed to start making missing persons flyers right away. So Kevin spent the rest of the day on Sunday printing flyers with her photo on it and looking for her in the area. He also called local hospitals and jails without any luck. He also went to a gas station near club space and asked the clerk if he had seen her. This visit checks out on surveillance footage, so it does show that Kevin was out there looking for his missing girlfriend. That Sunday night, Kevin went back to club space, but the club was closed. So he passed out some money to the homeless people in that area and asked them if they had seen Paula, but none of them had. At around 9 p.m. that day, 14 hours after, and 12 miles away from where Paula was last seen, a passerby in an industrial area of North Miami called the police and reported that there was a dumpster on fire. When police arrived, they found a body still burning inside. The remains had been burned beyond recognition, so much so that they couldn't even tell if the body was male or female. The dumpster was located near a propane tank business on Northwest 14th Avenue in the 1400 block of 130th Street in North Miami. The location was 120 blocks north of Club Space on an isolated dead-end street. Kevin had no idea that there had been a body discovered Sunday night. He spent the rest of the evening tossing and turning in bed, and finally he decided he needed someone else to help search for Paula. So he called private investigator David Wasser and hired him to do some digging. Kevin was finally able to report Paula missing early on that Monday. He also called her mother Patricia. It was Patricia's birthday that day, so she was probably expecting a call from her daughter, but instead got a call from Kevin, and he had to break her some horrible news that her daughter was missing, but it only got worse from there. After Kevin filed a missing persons report, the cops realized that their Jane Doe might just be Paula Sladuski. The body had been burned so badly that the police had to identify it using jewelry and dental records. They couldn't confirm the body's identity until that Tuesday. When Kevin called the medical examiner's office, he was hoping they wouldn't be the ones to tell him where his girlfriend was, but when he gave the medical examiner Paula's description, the medical examiner told him that he was sending a detective over. Things obviously weren't looking good. The body that they found was wearing earrings and had body piercings. One of the earrings was found five feet from the dumpster, so the detective asked if Paula had any body piercings and Kevin said yes. When he showed him a picture of the earring, Kevin's heart sank. And that's when he knew that Paula was gone. Then the police requested Paula's dental records from the family, so the family sent those over, and that's when the terrible news was confirmed. And an officer called up Kelly and told her to sit down. And unfortunately, that's when they confirmed that the remains belonged to her sister, Paula Sladuski. She was only 26 years old when she was murdered. Her mother, Patricia, was absolutely devastated by the news and overwhelmed with grief. She couldn't believe any of this was happening. And all she could think was, if Paula hadn't gone to that concert in Miami, she'd still be alive. Apparently, Paula had told her stepdad that Kevin was taking her to Las Vegas, so he was pretty surprised to hear that they were actually in Miami. Kevin said that they were originally planning on going to Las Vegas, but they changed their minds after they got the Lady Gaga concert tickets, and the whole Miami trip was actually Paula's idea. Paula's stepdad was super pissed with Kevin, especially the fact that he had left Paula drunk and alone in a club in an unfamiliar and rowdy city. Kevin told her mom that he didn't know why he had left her alone, but he said that he was absolutely traumatized by Paula's disappearance and that he had nothing to do with it. Her stepdad didn't know if Kevin had anything to do with Paula's death, but he did think that Kevin was negligent in the way he left her alone, exposed to potential predators. But now the police had a murder investigation on their hands and they needed to figure out who was behind such a horrific crime. Kelly flew down to Miami to help with the investigation and bring her sister's remains back to Michigan. She needed to know who killed her sister. Here's an interview clip of Kelly. I can't see myself going back to work. I can't, I can't see myself living a normal life until I know whoever did this is paid for it. 
I can only pray that somebody will come forward and somebody had to have seen something. It takes a sick person to do these sorts of things. Kelly believed that Paul's killer probably had scratches all over their face thanks to Paula's long nails. She said that Paula was definitely a scrapper and she would have put up a hell of a fight against anybody trying to hurt her. Since the body had been so horribly burned, an autopsy couldn't determine Paula's official cause of death. They also couldn't determine whether or not she had been sexually assaulted or if another crime had taken place. But they did figure out that Paula was already dead by the time her body was set on fire. They think that she was probably killed by strangulation since the autopsy showed no signs of stab or gunshot wounds. The police knew that they were going to have a very difficult investigation on their hands, but they needed to narrow down a list of suspects if they were going to solve this crime. They first took a look at the most obvious suspect, and that is Kevin Klim. After all, he did have those previous domestic violence charges against him, and other people in Paul's life reported that Kevin had actually been threatening her. And one of these people was David Coleman. David Coleman was an ex-boyfriend of Paula's. They had previously dated in the 90s, and they still kept in touch frequently. According to David, he and Paula had always had each other's backs. He lived only about 10 minutes from Paula and Kevin in Rancho Cucamonga. They texted frequently about drama and her relationship with Kevin, and David claimed that once... Paula actually texted him and asked for help after Kevin locked her in the garage. David said that Paula would text him asking for help all the time. Once she even texted David, quote, help me, I'm in trouble, he's trying to kill me. And apparently David had gotten texts of this nature from Paula before. And according to Patricia, Paula told her Kevin once said if she left him, he would quote, cut her up in little pieces and put her in a bag and they'd never find her body. The last time David talked to Paula was New Year's Day, and he said her text was pretty normal. It didn't sound like she was drunk or anything. This David guy is actually a pretty sketchy character, though. He's got a long rap sheet with multiple felony weapons charges, charges for manufacture or delivery of narcotics or cocaine, and receiving stolen property. But most notably, he's on the sex offender registry. In 1999, he was charged in Michigan with fourth-degree criminal sexual conduct. According to the Michigan State Penal Code, a person can be charged with fourth degree criminal sexual conduct if the victim is over 13 but under 16 and the actor is five or more years older than that person. Force or coercion is used in accomplishing a sexual contact. The accused has reason to know that the other person is mentally incapable, mentally incapacitated, or physically helpless and other related circumstances. So at the beginning of the episode, we talked about how Paula was dating a man twice her age. That man was actually none other than David Coleman. Kelly called CPS on him, and that's how he ended up on the sex offender registry. So Paula waited until she turned 18 and David got out of jail, and then they actually started dating again. David is not a suspect or a person of interest in Paula's murder, but given his past, he may not be the most reliable source of information. There's actually a clip of David talking about Paula's murder. Can't believe it's real. Dave Coleman's emotions are raw. His heart broken after learning his former girlfriend, the woman he still hoped one day would be his wife, was murdered. I was praying to God don't let this be. I said, I'll pull her out of there and marry her right now. Paula Sladuski's body found Sunday in a Miami dumpster. The 26-year-old model murdered and set on fire. We can't even give her an open casket. We can't even see her again. Sladuski lived in Rancho Cucamonga, but was vacationing in Miami, was last seen at a nightclub. Her current boyfriend telling police they'd argued and become separated at the club, and that he never saw her again. Hey, my girls. Paula, who once posed for Playboy, had moved to California from Michigan to pursue her modeling career, but also dreamt of owning her own business. Paula's Puppy Palace. She's going to get a little puppy store. Sorry. Yeah, I don't even know what to make of that clip. Definitely. Mm, it's just really weird. Weird, yeah. But I mean, I guess everybody deals with grief in different ways. But yeah. But the whole underage relationship yeah. thing is really strange and concerning for sure. So that leads us to suspects here. Obviously, Kevin Klim was named a person of interest by police. So not a suspect, but someone they were looking into. He talked to the police multiple times and reported that he was open to taking a lie detector test to clear his name. And the police did grill him pretty good, I think at least 12 hours. And over and over again, they asked him, you know, did you have anything to do with, with Paula's murder? And he told them that he couldn't confess to a crime he didn't commit. 
Obviously, he felt extremely bad for leaving her at the bar, but he wasn't her killer. Later on, the North Miami homicide detective who worked on Paul's case said that Kevin's alibi checked out 100%. So that surveillance footage really did exonerate him, and they were able to confirm the cab ride that he took. So he was kind of ruled out at that point. Plus, Kevin didn't know the area at all, and he didn't have a car either. It would have been very, very hard for him to get Paula's body to North Miami, an area he wouldn't have been familiar with, burn her and make his way back without being spotted somehow. Plus, hotel surveillance footage showed him returning to the hotel, and it doesn't show him leaving. It doesn't show Paula coming back either. So even though they had a rocky relationship and just a history in general, it's highly unlikely that Kevin was her killer. Kevin's private investigator had gotten footage from the club that showed Paula walking past two men toward the exit. And when she walked out, the two men followed her out. The PI said the footage matched the descriptions of two of the club's bouncers. Kelly also confirmed that the blonde woman in the video was her sister. The second video was from a camera high above the front entrance found by PI Dave Wasserman. It shows Kevin leaving the club at 7.17 a.m. The tape also shows Kevin begging the bouncers to bring Paula out with him. But they said no, Paula wanted to stay, and they told him to just go home. Paula's sister Kelly has said repeatedly that Kevin is innocent and that he had nothing to do with her murder. She thinks that Paula's killer was a stranger to her. I just thought of another thing too. I know I commented on the surveillance footage that we saw. It's also possible that maybe that is like an altered form of the footage and perhaps the real footage is much more clear and like the version they released to the public, they kind of like blurred or something, you know, did mm -hmm. some sort of effect to make it you yeah, know, less noticeable. Point. If that could have happened is what I'm thinking because it seems like based on the actual investigation that they had enough of a clear image that they were able to confirm you know what time Paula and Kevin left the club but why would they do that like wouldn't they want that footage out there in case someone you know yeah. who was there or like maybe passed by or some, yeah. something you know someone sees something and is like wait a second and it you know tips them off it, it could also be too that when they export the footage, like they, ex this is obviously like a copy of the footage that perhaps yeah. when the police were actually looking at it, it was on the DVR right. system. Like some of those older uh, security camera um, systems, like it's clear on the actual device itself. But then once you export, like when you export it, it's like a lower quality version of it. Yeah. Um. So I'm thinking it's something like that because it, like, based on what we just saw, I'm like, it seems nearly impossible to be able to identify. Who, who it was leaving, like identify anybody no. and be like, it just doesn't really make sense to me that if that was the actual quality of the footage, why on earth would you even have that in the first place? Like, what's the point if you can't really see anything? You know what I mean? I don't know, but I feel like at the same time, that might be exactly why they have it so poorly is so that the yeah, club well, itself doesn't have to really take responsibility, not so much for something like this, but something that could be deemed their fault. Um, but legally, maybe they have to have a camera there. Right. But right. it doesn't necessarily have to be the best quality. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder about that. I don't know. Either way, though, I mean, it's doesn't seem like it's that helpful, really. No. I mean, it says two men. Yeah. Confirm club employees. But it seems like they believe that Paula was abducted by an unidentified male. And we're going to get into that theory right after our last break here. You're allowed to switch things up when you feel like it. Yesterday you were jamming to country music, but today you're deep into your throwback playlist. Your go-to dessert is usually creme brulee, but you could really go for a slice of cake right about now. With Dipsy, you can always choose what feels good in the moment. Dipsy is an app Full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, no matter who you're into or what turns you on. Find stories about that intriguing surfer instructor with that Australian accent or hooking up with your hot yoga instructor. They even have stories designed specifically for your zodiac sign. New content is released every week, so in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, you can always find something new to explore. Dipsy also has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and now they also offer written stories. It's your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, or just heat things up with a partner. 
For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash milehire. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash milehire. That's dipsystories.com slash milehire. Shopping for clothes can be daunting. You never know if things will fit, returns are difficult, and sometimes you don't even know where to start. This season, let Stitch Fix do all the hard work. It's easy and fun to get started. First, take a few minutes to set up your Stitch Fix style profile, answer a few questions about what you like to wear, what you don't, and how open you are to trying new styles. Then Stitch Fix's expert stylists will go to work finding items exclusively for you. Every piece is handpicked for you and is unique to your size, style, and in your budget, making it the best way to discover clothes that make you look and feel your best. Stitch Fix will send you five pieces to try on at home, keep what you love, and send back what you don't. Shipping returns and exchanges are easy and free. This is my favorite thing about Stitch Fix is that not only do you get five items that most likely you want to keep all of them, but if for some reason there's items you don't want, basically they include a USPS bag that's already pre-labeled and all you got to do is throw those clothes that you don't want back into the bag, seal it, drop it in your mailbox, and your post person will pick it up and send it back to them. It's super easy and that's why I love it so much. Plus, there's no subscription required. Try once to set up automatic deliveries and there are no hidden fees ever. Sign up for Stitch Fix and get the season's latest pieces for women, men, and kids. Sign up today at stitchfix.com slash milehire20 to get $20 off your first purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash milehire20 to get $20 off your first purchase. Limited time offer and purchase within two days of sign up. At this point in the investigation, the police switched to looking for someone who may have abducted Paula from club space. They just needed to figure out who could have seen her leave. Unnamed witnesses outside of the club told police they saw Paula talking with a stranger in the parking lot before leaving with him. The only description those witnesses could give was that the stranger was a heavyset, six foot tall black male or Hispanic male with a goatee. Police actually released a sketch of a man wanted for questioning in connection with the case and can only describe him as a black man. Later, the police described their suspect as a man about six feet tall with a stocky build and light skin. They also said that this was not the same man that was captured on the security cameras with Paula. The surveillance footage, like we've been talking about from club space, was just too dark and grainy for the police to identify a suspect off of that. Regardless, they believe that suspect was the person witnesses saw talking to Paula outside of the club. Plus, they reportedly cleared all of club space's staff who worked there that night. According to Kevin, though, the police sketch looked like the bouncer that ID'd him and Paula at the club that night. He also said that he didn't know why the bouncer would have carded Paula in the first place because, quote, I just don't think that Paula in her best day looked under 21. As of today, we still don't know if there's any connection with that abandoned car to Paula's case. They haven't released any information about it publicly. But a random dumpster in North Miami is pretty far off from club space. It's not exactly a well-known spot, so the police suspected that the killer might be from that area or he at least knows that area of Miami well. So club space technically is not in the city or suburb of Miami, North Miami, but it is in an area right off Highway 395, a major highway uh, running through Miami. And it's kind of, it's definitely not in the best part of town. Like uh, Janelle, you were just reading through the reviews. Like, yeah, definitely don't want to be out alone. Yeah, I just Googled it and was reading people leaving reviews on like TripAdvisor and they were like, yeah, I wouldn't walk around here by yourself and especially at night. But then again, like, I wouldn't really walk around any city. By yeah, even on South Beach, I wouldn't. Yeah. If I was, I wouldn't be walking around by yourself. So, like, this yeah. is on Northeast 11th Street, and there are some other like bars and stuff there. Mm-hmm. But this isn't like South Beach, which, if you've ever been to Miami, South Beach is kind of like where all the really all the most popular bars yeah. and you know celebrities hang out there on South Beach, and it's kind of where most people go when you're you're visiting. So this is kind of like off the beaten path a little bit, which mm-hmm. you know doesn't necessarily mean anything negative. It's just, I mean, if you've ever been to Miami, I know I've been a number of times and I have gotten lost in Miami and found myself. And one time I was driving through Miami and I like took a wrong turn somewhere. And all of a sudden I was like in this alleyway somewhere and there was like just a group of guys, like nefarious looking individuals all kind of gathered around and they and i it was like at night too and i like rolled up on something clearly and the lights were on them and they're all just staring at me and i was like oh my god you're like i'm not trying to wrong turn yeah i was like yep turn around quickly (laughs) back like backed up and kind of like gunned it out of there but i mean miami is definitely not the the safest city in the united states that's for sure i mean you definitely got to be careful yeah no matter where you're at but 
I guess that could be true for pretty much anywhere these days. But so going back to who this potential killer was, clearly they knew this area because it was like an industrial park and a, a dead end street. So it's likely that it wasn't, you know, somebody that wasn't from the area. They also stated that Paula's murder was the work of a deranged, sadistic killer who was still on the loose, and they urged the public to come forward with any info. And that's when another unnamed witness made a report. Apparently, right around the time Paula went missing, a man walking his dog spotted a truck driving the wrong way down a one-way. But that street was about one block away from club space. The witness said the driver was a white man in his 50s, and he said that the truck drove towards a blonde woman who was clearly drunk and walking alone. And he identified that blonde woman as Paula. He said that the driver pulled up next to Paula and Paula got into that truck. The police took a report from this witness, but he says they never contacted him again. About two weeks after Paula was murdered, employees at Club Space recognized a man at the club one night. He looked like the man that actually talked to Paula while she was leaving the club that night. The employees called the police and they were actually able to track down the man. But after they interviewed him, he was released and they said he wasn't their guy. At one point, Kevin had claimed that one of the bouncers following Paula out of the club matched the police's sketch, but Club Space said the statement simply wasn't true. Club Space, according to their statement, interviewed the bouncers who escorted Paula out and cleared them. They also said that the bouncer he's talking about was a Caucasian male with no facial hair, so he couldn't have been the man in the police sketch. Kevin had also accused Club Space of replacing some of their staff members since Paula's disappearance, but the club denied that claim. In their statement, Club Space said that none of their employees gave the police a description of the suspect for their sketch. They said that this had to be a witness who saw the two outside of the club. It's true that the witness who gave police the description for their sketch was not a Space employee, but other staff members at Space saw Paula leaving the outside area with a man hand in hand, like they were a couple. So some staff members at least saw the suspect from behind. One of the bouncers was interviewed by the media, and he said that the man walking out with Paula couldn't have been someone she met inside the club. He was actually wearing shorts, and the dress code at Club Space strictly prohibited that. He claimed that our number one rule, no matter how much money you have, we do not allow you in with shorts on. And according to Club Space, the man Paul left with was not an employee or a customer at the club. And in the club owner's opinion, the guy she left with might not have been the guy that did the crime. Still, the police didn't know for sure if their suspect was a patron at the club that night, because are you going to take Club Space owner's word for it? Probably not. Mm -hmm. It just seems really weird because it's like she gets out, she gets out of the club and then immediately links up with somebody mm -hmm. like within five minutes of Kevin being kicked out. So it was like what well, it seems to more likely that it would have been somebody she had been talking to inside the club mm -hmm. that she then linked up outside of. It's unlikely that you get kicked out of the club and there's just some random guy standing outside and you all of a sudden like cozy up to that guy. But then again, she was very intoxicated. Yeah. So you don't know what's up, you know, mm -hmm. at that point. I mean, they've been partying all night. So she was probably drunk beyond, you know, any sort of comprehension of what's going on. And, and it's possible that she could have just, you know, somebody because, I mean, people hang outside of clubs all the oh, time, yeah. too. Like there's always like a group of people outside clubs just hanging out, smoking cigarettes, whatever it is. Right. So it is possible that maybe just somebody had been kind of scouting out the the place and that's what I was thinking and saw like an opportunity to mm -hmm. you know abduct abduct Paula but plus if she's alone right like he could have you know been waiting for that perfect person to come out alone and then maybe lied to her and was like hey I saw your friend or something like you need to come you know who knows could have made up some story as to why she needed to go with him and you know sadly being in that state of mind when you're intoxicated maybe she wasn't able to kind of like think cl through clearly and yeah. And it actually ended up, you know, trusting him. Yeah. It's just, it's so hard because it's like whenever, you know, you're drunk, it's just, you just never know. Like your your judgment just goes out the window. So, I mean, like Kevin's like, well, Paul is a, you know, she's a stripper and, you know, she's been doing this for a long time and she's, you know, been drunk a lot. So she's knows how to keep herself safe and mm -hmm. you know her instincts are good and, and all that so he seems to think that it's very unlikely that she would have just you know cozied up to somebody who had just randomly been standing outside the club that yeah. it seemed more likely that it was somebody she had been talking to or flirting with inside of club space mm -hmm. he really doesn't think it was somebody just off of the street he thinks that it was one of the bouncers still. But Paula's family obviously is just devastated by this and is very, very desperate to find out what happened to her. 
But months after her death, the police stopped giving them any real updates on the case. Back in February, police did release this sketch of a possible suspect. What's happened with the investigation since then? Uh, Meredith, it's been very frustrating because there's no new information. I know nothing more than I did back then. Um, we haven't, the police just tell us they're still following leads and that that's as far, that's as much information as they give us. So you ask for information, basically they say there's nothing to import here. Yeah, they, they say that they're still following leads. That's, that's the stock answer that we get. Why do you think the police have been unable to get any break? in this case and all this time? I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I, I'm sure that they want to find who did this and they want to solve this case. Um, you know, there could, be, there could be information out there that they didn't obtain. It's, it's really hard to say without them giving us any, any information. information. Rob, you yeah. were hired by the family, obviously, to help uh, look into this. What did you learn about the status of the investigation into Paula's death? <clears throat> well, unfortunately, we have uh, emailed and, and called uh, the detective that's in charge of the investigation, uh, and he has not uh, thus far spoken with us. But what would be the rationale for him not speaking to you? Well, uh, as a former prosecutor from New York, um, there, there can be reasons mm -hmm. uh, not to disclose certain sources or to jeopardize certain witnesses. By the same token, it would be nice to have a little bit more of a response just in terms of, generally speaking, what they're following up on. We actually have an investigator who has turned over witnesses to the police uh, who believe that they saw Paula leave the, the club space that night, and we don't know whether those witnesses have been investigated or, or spoken to. We also don't know whether a rape kit was done, which would be very important uh, information to have. We also don't know whether videos from outside club space and from the surrounding buildings have been obtained. If you take a look at the Uren uh, Vandersloot case, of course, that can bring an investigation to a very swift conclusion. We don't know what's going on. But if there were videos that. taken, would that tape even be available at this point? Is it is it played, you know, recorded over? Do you know anything about things like that? How long is it sustainable? If they well, were uh, different uh, commercial establishments have different policies with regard to how long they retain these things. Some 30 days, some 90 days, some longer. Uh, and we've sent some letters out asking for this evidence to be preserved. Uh, we've come on the case relatively recently. We hope that it's still available. And Kevin, you must have been playing this over and over in your mind, probably on a daily basis, wondering what happened. It's a nightmare. I just, it just doesn't end. You know, I mean, I want answers. I want to know what happened to her that night. I want to know why this happened. And just, there's nothing. Patsy, you lost your daughter in January. We've talked so much about her death. Tell us about her. She was my baby. She was a beautiful, beautiful woman. She, she just loved living. She loved traveling. She loved modeling. She loved life. Now she's gone. Well, we're hoping that by you all joining us this morning that somebody out there knows something and will come forward. We appreciate you all being here. Thank you so much. So from that clip, uh, the family had hired uh, this guy, Rob, which... I'm not 100 percent sure is either their investigator i think it's their attorney um since he's a former prosecutor um, it was hard to find information on him but he brought up a good point too of the fact that there should have been other businesses in that establishment which, which like we said there's other bars clubs on that street that probably did have there probably was some sort of outside surveillance video so it's i'm curious to know if there was footage other than club spaces that captured Paula's sort of last moments that she was in that area. But again, it sounds like we don't, we don't know yet. And they haven't really heard from North Miami police about any updates on the case. What also kind of stands out to me too, is the police sketch. Like the police sketch of that suspect is super detailed. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, if there's any more information related around that sketch, because it seems like that sketch is based off of, somebody who saw this man and I, I think it's difficult because it's like finding a needle in a haystack when you know you don't have much else to go off of besides that but it's interesting that kevin still is pretty adamant that he believes it was one of the bouncers at club space and club space again is denying that that is the case but it's a total mystery of who she left with was it somebody inside the club or somebody that happened to just be watching and waiting outside. We just don't know.
Paula's sister, Kelly, ended up writing a letter asking the Miami commissioner to end 24-hour clubs. She said that these clubs have a lot of issues with drugs and crime, and she brought up the fact that there had been multiple other deaths related to 24-hour clubs. Only a year before, actually, 18-year-old Jacqueline Torrilba went missing after attending club space. Later, her 30-year-old wannabe DJ boyfriend confessed to murdering her after they argued at the club. And Paula's family does put some of the blame for her death on club space. They say that they kicked her out without any help, drunk and alone, basically throwing her to the wolves. Robert Boyer says this binder is full of violent crime reports from the neighborhood where the club is located. We're talking about strong arm robberies, assaults, uh, assaults and batteries with weapons, without weapons, shootings, stabbings. Boyers argues the club should have done more to protect Paula when it threw her out alone. They essentially threw her to the wolves in an area that was a magnet for criminal activity. But club staffers have said they did nothing wrong and have cooperated with police, which detectives confirm. I 100% agree with the family's attorney. Like, the club definitely should have done more to have a security outside or something you know mm-hmm. like and make sure people are getting picked up by taxis or, or something yeah call her a cab or something versus just like throw her out to the wolves like you said and this area is definitely high crime area so that definitely i'm sure didn't make the family feel any better kelly also put up fifteen thousand dollars of her own money for paula's reward fund the owner of club space contributed to the fund by matching kelly's donation Flyers advertised a $30,000 reward for any information that could lead the police to Paula's killer. Thomas Bustle, who is Paula's brother, has spoken out and said that he doesn't think Kevin is guilty of killing his sister. But he does think that he's guilty of leaving her at the club. He called Kevin a coward and said he is partly responsible, in my opinion, just as much as the killer because it was his responsibility to protect her. Paul's brother said that if he had waited 20 minutes max, she would still be alive. In fact, if he had only waited five minutes, he would have seen his girlfriend leave the club. Honestly, I I agree with her brother too. Like, it's your girlfriend. Like, I just know me personally, I would never, ever just like leave Kendall alone outside of any establishment, let alone a club in a in a city I don't know. Yeah. But that to me is a little odd that he just like took off. And it's, it's just so weird that five minutes earlier he had been kicked out and he had already like gotten into a cab and went home right away. I mean, again, they're both intoxicated, so it's possible he just wasn't thinking straight and he just was like, just totally forgot about her in the moment and well, just plus, went back. It sounds like the relationship wasn't the greatest. Right, know, right. Well, that too. But regardless, I mean... They were still together. Yeah, and like, it's really sad that he just kind of bailed. Bailed, yeah. Again, Kevin has never been named a suspect in this case, and he regrets leaving Paula at the club every day. Unfortunately, in March of 2010, Patricia and her daughter Kelly got into a pretty bitter fight over Paula's Barbie doll collection. So like we said before, Paula had a huge collection of Barbie dolls, actually over 500 of them, and many of them were unopened. Patricia wanted to auction off the Barbie dolls and put the money towards a reward fund to help Paula's killer, but when Kelly found out she wanted to sell the dolls, she went to her sister's house and took them. Obviously, the collection had a lot of sentimental value to Kelly, so she wanted to keep the dolls, but the feud got so bitter that she and her mom actually stopped speaking. Patricia did have legal executorship over Paula's things, including the dolls in her cherry red Mustang convertible. She was very upset by the whole thing, and she told the news media that it felt like she'd lost two daughters. Fortunately, though, Patricia and Kelly have been able to bury the hatchet, and they're talking again, and they also decided to take classes on grieving together. Coping with Paula's death has been incredibly difficult for her mother. Her grief has been so great that at one point she contemplated suicide, but she's turned to her face so that she can keep living her life. She also wears a heart-shaped locket full of Paula's ashes every day so that Paula is always with her. Kevin Klim still blames himself for Paula's death and he's contemplated suicide over it. He says it's been a complete nightmare ever since Paula's murder. He told reporters, I wake up thinking if only I had stayed an extra 10, 20 minutes. If only, if only. The lead detective on this case says this is the one that still haunts him the most. After 10 years with no answers, he just wishes he could bring Paula and her family the justice they deserve. The family is still using P.I. David Wasser to look for clues in this case. Here's a little clip of the lead detective talking about Paul's case. As a detective, it's the one that I didn't solve when I was in the detective bureau. It's the one that I, I didn't have be able to give the family a type of closure, you know. Um, uh, so it, it does bother me. I still think about it still to this day. The murder devastated Sladuski's sister. My sister was 
26 years old. She was full of life. She was beautiful. She cared about everybody. And unfortunately, which is part of the reason why we're covering this case, is the fact there's just not been a lot of updates in the case at all. The police and Paula's family are still searching for her killer. And after over 12 years, this case is still unsolved. So with that, anyone out there with information about this case is asked to call the Miami-Dade Crime Stoppers at 305-471-TIPS or 8477. There is a reward of up to $3,000. But yeah, this uh, just came and imagine what this family's been through. It's just so horrible. It's just such a brutal crime too. I mean, it's just to have a loved one you know, murdered in that way and found in that way is just absolutely horrible. And to not know what happened to her, it's just, it's got to be the hardest thing. What's your gut telling you of what happened? Like, what? I, I think this, I think this is a, one of two things. Either it is somebody who worked at Club Space mm -hmm. and they are, uh, you know, a predator that's sort of hiding in disguise. Or I think the more likely scenario is this was a crime of opportunity and there's a lot of sketchy people in this area and there could have been i mean even a serial killer or just a you know somebody who saw her leaving and just randomly decided to to carry out this horrible horrible crime against her and it just was a you know wrong place wrong time sort of thing i mean clearly clearly it was somebody from this area or familiar with this area i mean the fact that her body was found in that dumpster in North Miami Industrial Park on a dead end. Mm -hmm. Like, clearly they knew where to dump the body. So, I, yeah, and based on the police sketch, I mean, it just seems like it'd be incredibly difficult to find find this person, if even that sketch is accurate of yeah. a representation of, of the actual person she left with. I, I think, though, that she did get a ride from somebody. Clearly she left that area pretty quickly because otherwise I feel like there would have been more eyewitnesses and you know, likely security footage from some business along that road that would have picked her up. It seems like maybe somebody had been sitting in their car sort of watching the club looking for that opportunity to take somebody and Paula walked out. Or for all we know, someone could have been stalking her. Sure. I mean, it's people, people are crazy and people do crazy things. It's possible somebody had seen her earlier in South Beach or something or or that night at the club, there was somebody there at one time and they saw her and they're like, you know, that's my victim. And then they left and sort of set it up. I mean, there's a million possibilities of how this could have gone down. I mean, I don't think, I don't think Kevin had anything to do with it. No, I don't think so either. I kind of think that she went out of the club, someone either kind of lured her in or took her or whatever and potentially did, you know, took advantage of her yeah. physically. And then I think maybe... I mean, this is just my theory, like could have accidentally killed her and then was like, holy shit, she's dead. And I need I need to burn her in order to get rid of the evidence. Right. Like the autopsy basically shows nothing because of the fact that she was burned. So, I mean, she could have been yeah, showing signs of death or, you know, strangulate. I mean, I don't know what yeah. it was and something, you know, there was a mark on her body, some type of physical evidence that showed like how she died. And because of that, this person was like, holy shit. I need to get rid of this evidence, and that's why they, you know, disposed of her body the way they did. But yeah, because I mean, the burning body is a pretty. I mean, that's a pretty. It's a pretty serious thing, and right. And to me, it kind of signals that this was somebody potentially a more dangerous individual as opposed to somebody like more accidental, like the way you just described it. Like, because if you think about it. I get yeah I guess if they sexually assaulted her and they were going to try to hide that fact and that was the only thing they could think of in a way to hide that but then again I don't know I don't know it's just I mean it's just such an evil thing to burn somebody yeah. like and what kind of person you know if you were to like create a criminal profile for that type of person God, I don't know I mean it's got to be a evil evil per to, to to do that the ultimately because the body was burned there's just so many unanswered questions we don't know i mean they weren't even they were only able to identify her through her body piercings jewelry and dental records i mean it seemed like there was really not that much for the medical examiner to go off of clearly whoever did it wanted to cover up what they did 
because she was drunk that night. I mean, she would she have even remembered if she was sexually assaulted by somebody and been able to identify that person? Um, if she had gone with somebody and they had sexually assaulted her, then maybe just like dumped her alive somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I know it's, all, it's morbid to be talking like this, but right. like I'm just trying to think of different scenarios. To me, this just seems like maybe maybe somebody who finds satisfaction in killing. You know what I mean? Versus like somebody who just saw her as like a you know somebody to take advantage sexually, or it was both. You know what I mean? Right. But. I mean, you never know. People are people are crazy. They do they do things that you wouldn't expect. So especially when you're like panicked like that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I agree. I think somebody somebody saw her, somehow approached her and was like, I'll give you a ride back to your hotel or something. And she she just, you know, she was intoxicated. It's just crazy that there was no like there wasn't more like accurate descriptions of like what vehicle she got in mm -hmm. or it's just like, at what point did she get picked up? Yeah. Was it in front of the club? Was it across the street? Was it farther down the street? Like, I guess, you know, if you're not really paying attention to that or paying attention to what's going around you, how are you going to notice that? Well, but, someone could have been like, hey, girl, come walk with me. I'll get you a ride home. But we got up my car is like, right, you know, right, a block away. And right. she was like, okay. And then that was, you know, she walked down True. the street yeah. with this dude and got yeah. in his car. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, just as such a, it's one of those where it's like, oh, man. This kind of stuff does happen, and yeah, got to be careful out there. It's yeah. because there are there are people out there that prey upon women, especially in these types of situations, intoxicated. And I mean, even like in college, even it's like I remember Kendall talking about. I think you guys like through your sorority had like safety talks with like the police or something. And like mm -hmm. you know, if you're leaving intoxicated from a party or something, or you know what I mean, yeah. like just safety things like go with a buddy don't go alone yeah. oh yeah for sure I have think mace on you and <laughs> it makes me think also though that the location doesn't help because miami is so touristy you know mm -hmm. and so it's a lot easier to prey on people who are not familiar with the area right, right. don't know people around that area you know they're just there to visit and that automatically i feel like makes you more of a of a potential you know, totally. victim because of the fact that this isn't your hometown, yeah. most likely, and you know it wasn't in her in her scenario. So, yeah, yeah, it's interesting that the family's attorney brought up uh, Vandersloot in that case because mm -hmm. there's a lot of there's definitely some parallels to that case. It's just yeah, being a being a woman and being in a tourist and in in an area you're not familiar with. So, yeah, you definitely don't want to be alone. Yeah, scary. It's really scary. And, you know, my heart goes out to the, the family of Paula because it's just got to be so hard to, to live with this and not know what happened. I know they just want closure. So hopefully, hopefully the Miami or the North Miami, Miami police are still working on this case and are chasing down leads. And maybe one day this case will be solved. Maybe somebody will come forward or, you know, some sort of evidence is found. I wonder, I still wonder if that car, that abandoned car that was found, has mm -hmm. any connection to this case. It seems like, to me, based on the silence that the, uh, other than what you just heard from the former detective, I think they do have some info. Like, I think they have more information than what we know, but it's kind of like at a standstill. Like, they've gotten a little bit farther, but they're not quite there yet. And they're still trying to put the whole thing together so that they can go and actually arrest somebody or indict somebody on mm -hmm. on this but again it's it's miami too there is people there that may have no record may have no trace to them too you know, from a very logistical perspective miami has a huge immigration population there and you know it is possible that there could be somebody there that we have no idea what their identity is because they just they don't even exist in the system you know mm -hmm. what i mean so it's just even harder to find find somebody in that sort of situation. But again, that could exist anywhere too. Yeah, so true. yeah, this is a really tough one. Um, hopefully this one gets solved one day. Again, all the info, if you do have information regarding this case, will be in the description show notes. But I'm going to wrap up today's episode there. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of the Mile Heart Podcast. And I'll see you next time.